Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. We are continuing on our Hybrid Vigor week tonight and are joined by Dr. Neil Fogarty, who uh, is going to talk to us about heterosis in lamb enterprises. So those of you who joined us on Tuesday night uh, would have got the download on heterosis in beef enterprises uh, and, and their outcomes and how you can implement them uh, in your beef herds. So tonight we are getting the sheep version and we thank Neil for joining us uh, and get right into it. So I just want to start with some housekeeping. You will notice this control panel that would have popped up when you opened the GoToWebinar. Uh, it should be at the top right hand corner of your screen. The orange or red button uh, that's at the top left hand corner of the control panel will uh, collapse and reinstate this control panel if you want to have a better look at the slides that Neil is uh, going to be presenting tonight. You should be able to hear us, but we cannot hear you. Uh, as Neil goes through his presentation, please type questions in the question box provided. Please make these questions as succinct as possible and I will relay them to Neil at the end of the webinar. So tonight we are joined by Dr Neil Fox. Fogarty um, from Neil Fogarty Consulting. He, Neil is formerly a principal research scientist and research leader at the New South Wales DPI uh, and he was also the genetics program manager at the Sheep CRC. Neil has over 45 years of research experience in genetic improvement, primarily in the Australian meat sheep industry including uh, technical support in the development of LAMPLAN, leader of the National Maternal Sire Central Progeny Test, project and initiation and implementation of the information nucleus in the sheep CRC. This work has resulted in over 150 peer-reviewed publications in international scientific journals as well as over 200 extension articles. So we're very, very lucky but to be joined by uh, Dr. Neil tonight and I will just change over to him so he can get started. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Hilary. Right. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, who's joining us tonight uh, for this uh, webinar. Um, I've, I've actually called it hybrid vigour and land production and some of the uh, topics that I want to touch on briefly tonight include uh, uh, what is hybrid vigour and how, how does it work, um, where does hybrid vigour express itself in sheep and how much productivity gain do you get in those particular areas. Um, how much hybrid vigour do you get from a simple crossbred system? And um, how much, how, how do you maximise that hybrid vigour in a composite self-replacing flock? And uh, finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, integrating selection and hybrid vigour to maximise fuel performance. So if we get started, um, what is hybrid vigour? Um, Crossbred progeny often express a higher level of performance or, or fitness uh, than uh, would be expected from the, from the average of uh, their parents. And uh, you can, um, if you look at um, the graph uh, on, on the screen now, uh, you can see um, we have an example of uh, one breed having a, a performance level of 10, uh, the second breed having a, a performance level of six. So the average of that would be, uh, you'd expect in the progeny to be eight, but in fact, the progeny perform at, at a level of nine. So that extra uh, unit of performance there is, is the hybrid vigor over and above the average of the uh, two parents. Uh, and we generally express that 
as a percentage in the, in the box on the right, it, you can see uh, the, the difference between uh, the progeny performance, the crossbred progeny performance and the average of the parents uh, is one. Uh, and we express that as a percentage of the parents average. Um, so it's one over eight or in this particular case, that would be 12 and a half percent hybrid vigor. Um, you'll, you'll notice actually that the uh, um, Hillary had the title as being heterosis. Um, hybrid vigor um, is uh, hybrid vigor and heterosis are really interchangeable terms. They, they, they really mean the same thing. So um, I'll probably mostly talk about hybrid vigor, but you could uh, use heterosis at the same same time. Um, what is hybrid vigor? Well, hybrid vigor is, is really the opposite of inbreeding depression. Um, inbreeding increases um, if, if you have two animals that are that are uh, closely related, their progeny will be will be inbred to some extent. What that means is that you will get uh, a higher incidence of uh, homogeneous or, or the same genes in the gene pairs. So a high incidence of um, like gene pairs, if if uh, is one way of putting it. So that that occurs with, with inbreeding and that, that leads to um, uh, some uh, deleterious effects in, on, on performance that can be, uh, if you have um, uh, lethal genes floating around in a population and you interbreed those together and increase the inbreeding level, you'll get a higher incidence of those homogeneous, oh, sorry, homozygous gene pairs, and uh, it'll lead to a, a, a drop in performance. When you cross the two breeds that are, that are not related, uh, that increases the incidence of the heterogeneous or unlike uh, gene, gene pairs in the progeny. And that's generally what, what leads to um, hybrid vigor, so that you uh, can expect to have a greater greater level of hybrid vigor in uh, crosses between two breeds that are that are widely different and and uh, very unrelated to each other. The example in uh, in, in sheep, of course, is a um, um, common border lester um, merino cross. And uh, the, the Border Lester is quite a distinct breed and the Merino is uh, quite distinct and they haven't been uh, uh, related for probably uh, hundreds of generations. So they are quite distinct and you would expect to have a higher level of uh, uh, hybrid vigor or heterosis when you cross two breeds like that compared with if you were to cross two strains of merino, for instance, uh, a stronger wool or, or a, and a finer wool, uh, you mightn't expect as much hybrid vigor in, in those crosses because the two uh, merino strains are more closely related. So if we uh, uh, look in sheep again, uh, what sort of levels of, of performance uh, enhancement do you expect from the hybrid vigor? In sheep, what are the what are the traits that um, uh, have the most hybrid vigor? And these are generally the uh, reproduction, lamb survival, and disease resistance traits. Um, there's there's not a lot of uh, definitive experiments have been done with with hybrid vigor, but there are um, over the years there have been. Um, estimates from different different sources. It's been it's very difficult to set up a a strict experiment to um, have two pure breeding lines under the same under the same conditions. 
So there haven't been a lot of experiments done, but uh, we've had um, various estimates over the years, and it's certainly the reproduction, um, the lamb survival and disease resistance traits are those ones that express the, the greatest level of hybrid vigour, and that's generally sort of 10 to 25% um, better performance in the progeny compared with the average of the parents. Um, again, that's a pretty big range from 10 to 25%, and it does vary a lot uh, between different breeds that um, uh, have been used in crossbreeding experiments. If we look at um, uh, growth and wool production traits, uh, they tend to be a little bit less, but they're of the order of 5 to 10% hybrid vigour for, for those traits. Whereas um, the, the, the uh, product quality traits, um, things like fibre diameter and carcass traits, there's generally a pretty low level of hybrid vigour, less than 5% uh, for those, those particular traits. So it's really the, uh, at, the, at the reproduction end and the lamb survival end that uh, uh, we get high levels of hybrid vigour. And also those traits um, are, are cumulative to some extent. If we think about um, fertility and lamb survival, uh, and then lamb growth, uh, you, you put all those together and you might think about a trait like the total weight of lamb weaned per year joined, so that you can get quite uh, high levels up at that upper, upper level of say 25% uh, hybrid vigour for uh, those, those cumulative, cumulative traits because they, they add together. If we look at a, uh, a simple uh, crossbred lamb system, and um, that, uh, that system has been very successful in Australia, it's been around for over 100 years. Um, um, the uh, Border Leicester rams made it to Merino ewes to produce that first cross Border Leicester Merino uh, progeny. Uh, the weather's going off for slaughter and the ewes being kept for, for um, uh, in more intensive lamb production. So in that particular case where we have the first cross um, Border Leicester Merino progeny, we, ma we are maximising the level of um, hybrid vigour for, for lamb survival and, and for uh, growth. If we, if we go to the, uh, um, the next phase of that uh, simple crossbreeding system where those borderless and merino ewes are mated to a terminal sire, might be pole dorset, um, it might be a suffolk, it might be something else. Uh, again, we're, we're looking at maximising the hybrid vigour for reproduction from the first cross ewes because um, uh, they are uh, the first cross between... Uh, Two, two breeds, so we're maximising the hybrid vigour there for, for reproduction traits. And uh, the second cross lambs, because we've got um, a, a different terminal sire breed involved to the Border Leicester and Merino, we're again getting maximum lamb survival and lamb growth from those, um, those second cross lambs. If we look at hybrid vigour in a composite flock, um, a composite flock where it's um, uh, self-replacing and, and interbreeding, um, if we have um, uh, in the line there, we've got uh, breed one mated with breed two, and we have what we call F1 progeny or first cross progeny, we're getting the maximum amount of hybrid vigour. We're getting 100% of the hybrid vigour that's available from, from that cross. If we then um, interbreed those first cross progeny, in other words, join the, uh, an F1 ram with an F1 U, we end up with what we call F2 progeny and we lose half of that 
hybrid vigor in that F2 progeny. And the reason for that is because we've, we've lost half of those uh, heterozygous uh, gene pairs. In, in that F2 progeny, we've got a quarter of the genes have gone back to um, being um, a homozygous pair from one parent and a quarter from the other parent. And we've only got half the progeny or ha half the genes pairs, sorry, that are heterozygous, that are, that are coming from, from the different uh, breeds involved. So in that, um, that, that first um, interbreeding of the first cross progeny, we're losing half of the hybrid vigor that we might have had in the first generation. But I guess the good news is that if you continue doing that um, interbreeding, so uh, we can we breed an F2 with a with another F2, uh, we get what's called F3 progeny. Uh, we still have 50% uh, of the hybrid vigor, so we don't lose any more if you continue uh, interbreeding um, from from those uh, two first first breeds. So you lose 50% in the first generation, but you don't lose any more in subsequent generations with uh, two breeds in, in the composite. If we go to a uh, three breed composite, um, we actually, we still lose a little bit of hybrid vigor, but uh, we only lose about a third on average. It, it obviously depends a bit on um, the, the uh, breed uh, composition in the composites. But, but on average, if there are three breeds, um, uh, roughly equal proportions of, uh, of genes from those three breeds, you'll end up with about uh, two thirds of the maximum hybrid vigor that you, that you can uh, expect. If we go to a four breed composite, again, um, depending on uh, the four breeds being roughly equal, we end up with an average of about 75%. So in other words, the more breeds that you have in the composite, the, uh, the less hybrid vigor you, you lose, if you like, in uh, uh, those subsequent generations when you're in, interbreeding. So I guess finally, the, 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 the final point I'd, I'd like to make is um, we need to think about a selection uh, in, in um, combination with hybrid vigor to, to maximize that, the performance. Um, you really do need to use animals with the highest genetic merit. The, uh, I guess you need to think about hybrid vigor as um, uh, as being a bonus, especially for the for the reproduction and the and the fitness traits, and um, uh, the, the hybrid vigor really won't overcome poor genetics in the parents. So uh, if we if we think about um, um, the sort of variation that there can be within a breed. Um, Many of the experiments that, that I've done over the years, and particularly the uh, uh, maternal sire central progeny test, um, it, it, it really showed that uh, the, the, the variation within the breeds was quite often about twice as great as, as, as variation between breeds. So while you're getting a little bit of um, extra performance from, from the hybrid vigor, you really need to make sure that the, um, the base genetics of the parents is, is as high as possible because um, hybrid vigor won't overcome poor genetics in the, in the parents. So we might uh, leave it there um, and I'm happy to uh, pursue any questions that Hillary may have. Great, thanks Neil. Uh, just to give Neil a bit of a break uh, before we jump into questions, so please type them in the question box provided um, and make them as succinct as possible. Um, 
Next week, Tuesday night, 8 p.m. again, we have John Webber from the University of Melbourne talking to us about selecting a prime lamb lambing date. So please make sure you tune in for that one. Uh, also, those of you who have to head off now, please make sure you take five minutes to complete the end of uh, webinar survey. Um, this survey is really important. It goes back to the likes of MLA, Home Sackett, and uh, who are the webinar facilitators, and Neil, um, to make sure that uh, our extension efforts are, are reaching the, the right audience and um, you're, you're getting what, what you're looking for. So um, we'll go back to the questions now. Please write them in the question box provided um, if you do have any. Uh, so Neil, I'll, I'll get us started. Um, your last point there was hybrid vigour won't overcome poor genetics of the parents. Uh, so in that respect, um, when you do want to, say if you're wanting to get the most out of your um, hybrid vigour, is there certain um, ASBVs that I guess um, can relate to a um, a higher performance um, from your hybrid vigour that you can sort of point out, or is it just really what your breeding values are? Well, it's basically the the uh, the the traits that that have the highest hybrid vigour are uh, the reproduction and 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 fitness traits. So. Um, Number of lambs weaned, and and that's that's actually a a, a cumulative trait because it it it, it includes uh, fertility, um, number of lambs born, and lamb survival, and that tends to accumulate. Um, so you you're adding together the hybrid vigour for each of those traits. So it can be quite uh, significant the the amount of hybrid vigour you get. From uh, uh, from a trait like um, a number of lambs weaned. Okay, thanks, Neil. We're just you're just breaking up a little bit there. Um, that's okay. I think you're back online now. Uh, so also uh, on Tuesday night's webinar, uh, Wayne. Um, pointed to the fact that research um, that he has done has shown that uh, hybrid vigour is correlated with um, pasture quality and the amount that you sort of get out of uh, your crosses um, can be dependent on also what what um, nutrients the, the, um, the animals are intaking. Have you come across something similar in your research yeah that's that's certain, certainly the case in sheep too I mean um, the uh, more hybrid vigor will be be expressed for particularly for say growth um, if if they're on uh, good nutrition and growing well I mean if they're if the animals um, haven't got um, if, if conditions are pretty poor um, and then they're, they're not growing well um, often there, there won't be a lot of hybrid vigor expressed um, I guess the um, perhaps the exception to that might well be um, in a in a, a disease type situation uh, where you um, if if you've got um, Good hybrid vigour for for particular disease resistance and de, and, de, and depending on the environment in which they're 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 being run. If they're not not being exposed to it to uh, the disease, well, the hybrid vigour won't won't be expressed. But um, if they are being uh, exposed uh, to a disease quite um, quite heavily, um, the hybrid vigour then may well be um, expressed and expressed at a fairly high level. Great, thanks Neil. Uh, just a question from Andrew. 
at what level of inbreeding does genetic suppression start or what percentage of inbreeding is too high? Well, I mean, all, all breeds have a certain amount of inbreeding there and and it's not, it's, it's really the rate of inbreeding that's important because what happens uh, when animals are, are inbred, uh, there's a certain amount of natural selection goes on or, or even um, uh, you know, artificial selection that we, we impose. So um, if you've got a, a, a low level of um, increase in, in, in breeding, the selection that you do and the natural selection that occurs uh, can quite easily overcome that. But if you have high levels of inbreeding, that's when you start to see a, a, a decline in performance. Um, and um, um, it, it, really, um, uh, it, it really shouldn't be a problem if, um, uh, you're turning sires over reasonably quickly so that um, they're only being used for two or three years or so um, and, and you're using a reasonable number of sires. But it becomes a problem if, particularly if you um, are mating uh, close relatives that might be, might be cousins or, or particularly if they're um, you know, size on daughters, that, that sort of thing. Uh, that really increases the inbreeding um, very rapidly and you find that, that artificial selection or natural selection can't uh, overcome the, the decline in performance that you get from, from that. Um, it's, I guess it's recommended um, you really shouldn't be increasing inbreeding. Um, once it gets above about a half a percent per generation, that is, starts to become a bit of a problem. Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, another question from Alison. Can mixed purebreds such as Australian white still be considered to have hybrid vigour or is this lost once the breeders become F5? Um, no, they, they um, it, the, I guess the hybrid vigour is, is related to the um, uh, proportion of uh, heterozygous uh, gene pairs so that um, um, if, if you've got um, uh, a, a small proportion of, of, of a particular breed, let's say in, in, in the Australian white, um, and you're mating it to that other, other pure breed, you'll lose a little bit, but um, if, if it's only, um, you know, 5% of, uh, or 10% of the genotype, uh, you're, you're, you're not going to lose a lot of the hybrid vigour because it's, the hybrid vigour is, is, is directly related to that, uh, the incidence of those heterozygous gene pairs. Great, thanks Neil. Um, a bit of a hairy one from Colin here. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please get them in quick because this uh, it looks like it will be the last one. I'm not sure how you'll go with this one, Neil, but Colin wants to know how you would optimise hybrid vigour in a mob of rangeland goats where unknown breeds have been mixed over hundreds of generations. <laughs> mm. um, well, I suppose it depends a bit on what you were going to do with, the, um, with those goats. If you were... Um, I mean, you might um, 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 if you if you running them for for meat, uh, you might you might want to uh, um, um, 
put something like a you know a bore gate if there's been if there's no um, been very little um, injection of bore genes into into that um, feral population. Uh, uh, that might be one way of, of trying to uh, uh, maximise the hybrid vigour. But I guess the other thing about, about um, um, a, a feral goat population like that is that there's probably a fairly high level of um, hybrid vigour in them uh, as they are because um, there's um, there's probably been lots of um, lots of boars mating across the population, um, and there's probably been a, um, as you say input from lots of different different sources. So they're getting genes from lots of different sources, so that there'll already be a reasonably high proportion of uh, heterozygous gene pairs amongst them anyway, and there'll be um, a pretty um, high uh, level of uh, natural selection going on. So, um, um, and that natural selection will tend to knock out animals that have lots of homozygous gene pairs. Great, well done, thanks Neil. <laughs> So that seems to be the last question for tonight. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in uh, and listening to the talk on hybrid vigour in lamb production. Uh, thank you very much, Neil, for taking the time to give us that really informative talk tonight. Everyone thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and remember, Tuesday, 8 p.m. Uh, next week, we have John Webb Ware talking to us about selecting a prime lamb lambing date. Uh, and I hope to see you all then. Thanks, Neil. Thanks a lot, Hilary, and thanks, everyone.